Hello and welcome again to Backpage. I'm Jody C. and today we're visiting with Fred Leeson and Jewel Lansing. Welcome, welcoming Jewel back to the show again. They've collaborated on a um, very interesting book with a lot of information. It's called Multnomah. So welcome to the show. Thank you. It's fun to be here. Tell me, tell us how this collaboration came about and why you did it. There's a lot of information in this book. This is Multnomah is Oregon's most populous County. county, and yet, and smallest, smallest. In geographical yeah. size. Yeah. So, what what was your purpose in this? Well, it actually started as a companion book to the Portland history that mm -hmm. I did nine years ago, and this one I just needed help. And Fred has uh, thirty years of experience in journalism in the Portland area, and it was mm -hmm. a nice fit. So. Um, Talk about your background. You were county auditor and city auditor? I was auditor? a county auditor for eight years and mm -hmm. a city auditor for four years, both elected positions, yes. And when I was in the city, I was in charge of the archives mm -hmm. and got especially interested in the history of the area. And of course, uh, uh, I've always loved Northwest history mm -hmm. and, and my husband the same. So we have a delightful library, which helps mm -hmm. too with research. Well, you know, it's, it's fascinating when you start reading books like this because you recognize names, mm -hmm. um, you know, th that, are, that are now names of streets, you right. know, like right. Corbett and Vaughn and right. Lovejoy. And, right. and uh, so to find out all about those people in here was pretty fascinating. And so your background was what? Fred? Well, I was a newspaper reporter, and I w worked uh, my first 10 years with the Oregon Journal, which was the afternoon newspaper, which uh, died in 1982, was merged into the Oregonian. Okay. And so then I worked on the Oregonian until my retirement in 2007. Spent a lot of that time uh, covering local government. I covered city and county government for several years. Mm -hmm. Spent a lot of time covering courts. So local history, I mean, I've lived through a lot of the local political history right. of the past 30 or 40 years. Uh, and I've always been fascinated by local history. I mean, local government is a government that affects us the most. Our streets, our water, our police, our fire, our courts, our jails, mm -hmm. the social services. Uh, people spend most of their time talking about who's running for president. Uh, I've always been much more concerned about what's happening at my local government. Right. So that's how I got involved who's in local Who's running for school history. board. Exactly. Yep. Well, you know, in, in reading things like this, and there's, it's, it's a, lot of, uh, a lot of information to process. And... Every time I thought, oh, this is this is too much information, just in terms of numbers and like that, but you would you would toss in a little smut and gossip, which kept me hooked. <laughs> oh, you good. know, and so it's like reading a very thick People magazine in a way. Well, but, uh, and, and and I think that was what we wanted to do. I mean, yeah. I, Jewel is absolutely tenacious on factual details. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's just fabulous. Uh, and That's because she was a bean counter. A, exactly. You know? Well, that you has know, to be precise. Some people pay attention mm -hmm. to detail more than others, and I'd have to say Jewel pays more attention to detail than I did. I yeah. think the only mistake that we are aware of in the book so far is one that I made. I blew a first name of somebody, and mm. uh, I, I regret that. So, I mean, that's on me. Uh, but I, I was interested, mo a lot of my work was kind of in the early part of the history. Jewel's was really from 66 on was, mm -hmm. was largely Jewel. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I learned about Rufus Holman for the first time, who was incredibly in, influential in the first couple uh, decades of the 20th century, uh, was, you know, unknown to me, essentially. Very interesting, colorful, mm -hmm. controversial character. Accomplished a lot in his 12 years on the county board. So, um, what was your favorite part in, in tracing all of this back? Like Multnomah, the, even the name Multnomah, where did it come from? Oh, it's an old Indian name, yeah. And generally, there are all sorts of theories as to exactly how it was originally spelled. And, and mainly, the idea is that a tribe of Indians called the Multnomahs were headquartered on the Soviet Island mm -hmm. uh, in Multnomah County, which is very close to Columbia County. Mm -hmm. But that's, that's generally from the Indian beginnings. And, and, and Lewis and Clark had the first contact with the Multnomahs, that, okay. at least that I'm aware of, yeah. uh, and, uh, and, and visited Sovie Island and actually came down the river, I guess you would call it upriver, into Portland, mm -hmm. uh, below the bluff of where now the University of Portland is and camped one night. It was a brief stay. Uh, but I believe that Multnomah, they were the first to sort of to quote that name, and they spelled it differently, but that's mm -hmm. what we believe it to be. But, but the Multnomah County runs 50 miles this way along the rivers, mm -hmm. river banks, but it's only narrow, and so it's a strange, it goes all the way to Multnomah Falls, 
and the Columbia Gorge and then all the way out to Sole Island at sea level. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's really a diverse, beautiful, physically fi beautiful county. Well, so how did, like when, who, which came first, Multnomah County or Clackamas County? Well, Clackamas was there as a bigger one mm -hmm. and the uh, Multnomah was created about half out of Washington County and half out of Clackamas County. Mm -hmm. And, and, and Multnomah got started. I mean, originally the Oregon Territory, I believe wasn't it four counties, which was for the entire yeah. state of Washington and the state of Oregon. Uh, Hillsboro was the county seat for Tuolity County, it was then called, which Portland was originally a part of. Mm -hmm. uh, and when it became apparent that Portland was going to be the big city in the region, uh, business people in Portland didn't want to have to take an entire day to ride their horses out to Hillsboro to, f to file land use matters or deeds or recording or d deal with taxes or take care of county government. So that was the incentive to create uh, Multnomah County because that's where Portland was going to be the, uh, the population seat. It was don't, very clear. Don't you think that's fascinating? Oh, and, I mean. <laughs> and originally the, the capital was going to be, or the big city was supposed to be Oregon City. Correct. Right? But, and, and I can't remember, it seems like there was a a, a pistol fight in a bar or something and all of that changed to Portland. Where did I read that? Did I make that up? <clears throat> uh, well, I'm, <laughs> Maybe I'm uh, thinking about Texas. Yeah, you know? well, uh, P Portland was never the capital. I think there was tremendous political infighting right. between Salem and Oregon City and I, in my history of Salem is not well, that and good. Well, of Corvallis too. Corvallis was in that was mix, in mix of, mm -hmm. of, of how, who was the power and it, it, Salem really had the power in the state. How did that happen? How did they have so much power, do you think? <laughs> Fred, here oh, you. <laughs> Scal I, scalawags? Well, I, See, this is what makes it fun. Yeah, yeah. no, and, and, and I, I'm not that well versed in it, but I, I think it would have been the political power brokers at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, there has always been a concern when it was clear that Portland was going to be the big city, that mm -hmm. we didn't want Portland to dominate the state. Yeah. Uh, and so there's always been a tension between Portland and, and downstate and the rest of the state. And I think that uh, I think one of the reasons Salem probably won out was that uh, the, we were, people were distrustful of how big and how powerful this Portland mm -hmm. thing was going to become. And it, it certainly did become big and powerful. Well, you know, I always thought that, a, that the capital of a state was chosen because it was kind of mid-distance between, you know, areas. So it wouldn't be, they wouldn't put it in Portland because... It would favor I, I'm people sure that that, that was area, a factor. That would know? have been an issue. And at that time, there would have been very few people. Eastern Oregon was very sparsely populated. So in terms of the Willamette Valley, which is mm -hmm. where the pioneers, which was the big attraction for the Oregon Trail and drawing right. the pioneers to Oregon, uh, Salem would have been a, a, a reasonably central location in, the, in that kind of context. Mm -hmm. So how did you find all of this out? Did you spend... Days well, and when years I, at the when I started my research on my Portland book, my original thought was to include both city and county governments. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was very clear early on that there was way too much information. And uh, as you recall, the Portland book is twice as thick yeah. as, as the Multnomah book. But uh, counties came from a different background than cities did. The city of Portland was chartered way before the county was even, Multnomah County was formed. Mm -hmm. So the cities always had a leg up as far as uh, getting, uh, going wherever they wanted to go and having uh, authority for self-government that the county never had. In fact, until home rule in 1966, uh, the county uh, was ruled by three commissioners and, and all of them were elected at large and they chose one of their own to be the chair. So in the Portland book, we talk about the mayors and it's organized around the mayors. There's no, nothing in county government that's parallel to that, hmm. be, simply because it, counties generally were started as an arm of the state to collect the taxes, uh, the property taxes, to do the, vote, the elections for, things that the state wanted done, they relied on the county. Yeah, the county was really an administrative agency of the state, and then mm -hmm. that changed with home rule in 1966 when our voters, rightly or wrongly, said we want to, we want to create this larger county commission and give it legislative authority to create rules and, and to uh, do things such as land use planning and so on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, 
I mean, it re really incredible, fascinating history because that Home Rule Charter was oh, a, yeah. what was sort of on the same ballot when the city was going to change its yeah. city charter. <laughs> Tremendously controversial thing the city charter was, and it was it was it was defeated uh, why, because why was it so controversial? Well, well I think it, it wasn't going to be the strong mayor form of government uh, change. Oh, Portland, the city of Portland has a very nowadays considered antiquated commission form of government where all five people on the city council have some administrative authority. Mm -hmm. The mayor has the power to assign bureaus, but that's really the only power that the mayor has mm -hmm. that's exclusively to the mayor. Uh, he or she can divvy up who does what. So you, you sort of got, some people call this hydra-headed monster where, well, gee whiz, if I've got a garbage problem or a sewer problem or a parks problem, which commissioner is in charge? Who do I find? Who do I call? Mm -hmm. Whereas a strong mayor form, uh, the council sets policy, but the mayor is the executive that runs everything, and that, yes. that's what the modern plan was uh, for the uh, for the new uh, city charter. Uh, and voters rejected it, didn't like the idea of a strong mayor because it was called a strong mayor forum. Ironically, at the same time that they passed home rule, home rule gave the county chairman, it was then called, now we say chair, much more power than the mayor because not only did the county hmm. chairman have all the executive power to run everything in the county, but also sat on the policy-making council and held 20% of the vote. So here you got somebody with 100% of the executive authority to run business and 20% of the legislative uh, uh, power to set the policy. Much more powerful even than the so-called strong mayor, mm -hmm. uh, which city voters rejected. Uh, Jewell's theory, and I think it's right, is because people didn't understand that you were giving all this power to the chairman. It was called a home rule charter. And that sounds, that sounds sensible, doesn't it? That sounds like something we can all live with, home rule, uh, <laughs> as opposed to the strong chairman right. form. Right. It, well, it, do, it does sound sweeter, doesn't it? Easier. I mean, home e rule, easier yeah. to digest. Oh, yes. we can do that. That's right. Mom and pop are in charge here. <laughs> so you were part of a, a um, group of women, the movers and shakers that happened in the 70s and 80s. And there was there was uh, Betty Roberts, mm -hmm. Barbara Roberts, you, Caroline Miller, Vera Katz, Norma Paulus, who else? Oh, there. <clears throat> I, I would hate to start with, uh, <laughs> because I'd for Lose sure leave somebody out. But yeah. it, it certainly is true that there has been. Uh, uh, <clears throat> when I was elected to the county, uh, I, along with Alice Corbett, who was mm -hmm. elected to the board. We were the first two women who had ever been elected to county office. But then within 15 years, the whole board was entirely made up of women, of mm -hmm. five women. Yeah. And they were actually, in Multnomah County, they were the first in the whole country to have an all-woman board. And, uh, and it happened so fast, once the barrier is broken, well, uh, it's been interesting on the, on the state level too that there, there were barriers where no woman had ever been elected. Uh, for instance, Betty Roberts when she was elected to the Supreme Court mm -hmm. and Barbara Roberts an elected governor and those are breaking the barriers. Mm -hmm. uh, and once that happens, uh, it makes a more even playing field. How did that go with your family when you decided to run for office, run for public office? With, that, with your family, was that difficult or did they all jump on oh, board? Oh, well actually I was fortunate in that my kids were teenagers mm -hmm. by the time I decided to run for office and so they were of an age that they could be involved in the campaign and things. I, it is more difficult for women who have younger children, there's yeah. no doubt about it. Well, did you have to raise a lot of money? How did you do it? I mean, oh, well. <laughs> or just knock on every <laughs> door was, in Multnomah County? Oh no, you don't knock on every door in Multnomah County. No, it's, it's way too big to mm -hmm. do that. And raising money is one of the most difficult parts of running for office, yeah. but it has to be done. Well, and I want to chime in here because I was covering city and county mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. time. Uh, Jewel was a breath of fresh air to local government, and I think people realized that as soon as she ran. Mm -hmm. The old county auditors uh, were not professionally trained. They were kind of good old, old school politicians. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I think when voters got a chance to see a CPA with real credentials who did real work and was an absolutely credible figure, um, my recollection yeah. is, that, is that was a pretty easy election, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, and Jewell came in with, with Don Clark and really was the start of the modern era of county government. So I'll, well, I'll so give her credit for that, so you're the first <laughs> among ever things. You were the first one with an adding machine? Well, mm -hmm. yeah, not mm -hmm. really. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Anyway, so when the, the two of you wrote this book, and it's, it was published by Oregon State University Press, right. which is, is, they always do such good work. Right. It feels right. good in my hand that, you know, the cover of it's mm -hmm. good, and, and I, it's just always well done, whatever mm -hmm. OSU does. Mm -hmm. Where can people get this book? And are you doing a book tour together? What are you doing? Well, we, we have made some appearances at local bookstores. Mm -hmm. uh, we were at uh, a Wordstock in, uh, in October. Mm -hmm. uh, w when you write a local history, there are no grand tours. Uh, you're mostly going around Here. to, uh, exactly, like this is it. Multnomah, for example. Yep, yeah. yep. Uh, so we, we've been hitting uh, some of the local bookstores and uh, everybody seems to, I mean, it, it's in stock, it's, it's widely available. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's not like we're, we're spending, you know, months and months on the road going from city to city. Right. So you, what I like about things like this is that it, it's interesting not only to people who grew up here, but people like me who transplanted here. Right. Um, just because I like to, kn I like to know the, the scoop. Right. You know, right, right. Um, when my grandmother died uh, many years ago, I found this shoe box in her closet, and it had all these envelopes in it, and and on each envelope was written the name of, of her eight grandchildren, and so she would tear out articles out of magazines and newspapers and put them in the appropriate envelope. We never saw them. <laughs> <laughs> until after she died. But all of the ones in my envelope were about Texas history because I was interested mm -hmm. in Texas history. My cousin Shirley's were all about finding a job because <laughs> my grandmother was afraid she was going to be <laughs> and never going to find a job. <laughs> anyway, so talk to me about life since you retired. What do you do now besides write books with Jewel? Well, I, I still do a little bit of writing. Uh, I like to write about architecture, so I write on uh, Portland's uh, a man named Brian Libby some years ago started PortlandArchitecture.com and I write for Brian. Mm -hmm. uh, also I'm very involved in the architectural uh, preservation movement. We have a Bosco Milligan Foundation in Portland which runs an architectural heritage center. We are advocates of teaching people about the uh, residents, homeowners, whoever, uh, building owners, about the value of old buildings, the mm -hmm. role they play in our history, and why they should be preserved. And I'm on the president of the board of Bosco Milligan Foundation, so mm -hmm. that's a very time-consuming uh, activity, very enjoyable activity. Um, we had a guy on the show named Alex Fontana who wrote a book called Pittock about Henry Louis Pittock. Mm -hmm. The Pittock Mansion. Uh, yeah, and the Pittock Mansion. And Henry was a teeny little guy. He was like 5'1", but Built this incredible mansion. Built yeah. this gigantic house. You know, it was like this. <laughs> Lives little, of the rich and famous. Little mouse years ago. family yeah. running around yeah. through the Pittock mansion, but um, all of that stuff was interesting to me because when Henry Pittock walked into Oregon City, he had no shoes. He'd lost his shoes in a flood or a storm, <laughs> and don't you think that's fascinating? Very, I mean, it's a, it's a very that, successful businessman. He started off with nothing, not even shoes. Well, you have to realize uh, pioneers that came in that era, and he was certainly one of mm -hmm. them, uh, came here to seek their fortunes. That was the number one thing. Yeah. Uh, most of the pioneers were young men uh, mm -hmm. because they had the energy, they had the, they had the drive. Uh, some of them may have been unhappy at home in their own situations and wanted to come to this new place and, and find start their over. fortune. Exactly, yeah. or start new or see, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, it, go for the brass ring, and Henry Pittock was certainly one of those. He was a very influential businessman. Uh, in addition, he was involved in many in, uh, business interests other than the newspaper, but I think it was the newspaper was mm -hmm. for, mostly for w what he's remembered for. Well, and you know, one of the big ones with him was that um, he he realized after he got the newspaper that they were buying their news their their paper from mills in California, and he thought that's stupid. We have trees. We'll make our own paper. <laughs> we ever, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. so that's what he began doing. Tell me who you think the best mayor of Portland ever was. Well, I think the early mayors uh, were there as volunteers. There was a Henry Failing and mm -hmm. uh, uh, what's the Ladd's edition, mm -hmm. uh, William Ladd. They were really outstanding. And there's no doubt that, er, that uh, Neil Goldschmidt, at the time that he was mayor, as mm -hmm. far as uh, the work that he did, uh, would be there with the best of them. And unfortunately, his reputation uh, has tanked because of... Yeah. of uh, well, he destroyed himself, and that's... He you really know, did. Yeah. You know, it's no a way, very, no very, uh, very sad story. Yeah. But uh, when you talk about... Uh, Vera was a, an excellent mayor. I love, I loved it excellent. when Vera Katz Vera was, was the... The mayor, when that year that it, uh, that awful storm and it flooded and everything, oh, yeah. and, and yes. yeah, and people were putting up barricades right, to try to keep the right, downtown right. from flooding, right. and Vera was not in the carpeted office. She was 
running up and down the line. She right. was the cheerleader in right. her right. purple rain suit, yeah. you know. Tremendously energetic person. Yeah. She had a great record. And we had another mayor, this was early on, I think 1906, Harry Lane, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, municipal politics were pretty corrupt in, in that mm -hmm. era, and mm -hmm. Harry Lane was one of the, was a medical doctor and was one of the great reformers. And there were a lot of people that felt that Goldschmidt had been the most successful mayor since Harry Lane. Mm -hmm. uh, I, th I think Terry Shrunk was awfully good. He was 16 years, uh, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure has anybody else gone 16 years. I don't think so. Well, uh, uh, yes, uh, George Baker. Oh, okay, right, okay, yeah, George Baker, who was some was a vaudeville showman, uh, and I think was probably not one of our highlights of mayor, but was a very, very popular, very, very popular, popular man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Is there a, a time limit on, like, could somebody conceivably be just? Mayor forever. Well, if they keep getting elected. one of the, the the sad stories or the uh, the difficult stories about Multnomah County history is that with home rule, it meant that the people could vote on changing the government regularly, mm -hmm. and there were some very onerous provisions added. And one of those provisions was term limits, so that Mult the city has no term limits. They mm -hmm. could be mayor, you could be or mayor council for 30 forever. years if you wanted. Yeah. But wow. in the county, they are limited to two four-year terms. Mm -hmm. So uh, that uh, that's been very difficult for uh, elected officials there to plan uh, for a political future because they have to leave at the end of yeah. and furthermore they can't run for another office without resigning if unless it's the if very last incumbent. last year really yeah, I, it's I, very I, stringent well and i think there's been an interesting dynamic that kind of runs through the history of multnomah county is that you've got, really got this almost kind of bipolar situation you've got the downtown big city business community mm -hmm. uh, aware that government provides services and that we need government you have what we used to call East County, very rural oriented, farm oriented, people that don't like government, don't trust government, mm -hmm. don't want to pay for government. Mm -hmm. uh, and county races and, and ballot measures have always, for some, whatever reason, been much easier to get on the ballot and less expensive to promote. So people that I would say, uh, I was going to say dingbat, but that's probably too strong of a term, people that we might call gadflies that really didn't know what they were doing or didn't really care if they destroyed local government, mm -hmm. uh, were able to put a lot of these ballot measures on, the charter changes that sounded as if they were reasonable, but in a lot of ways were really in not very uh, not very intelligent. I think we're actually kind of backwards. And uh, and I don't know if we still have that dichotomy or not. Maybe it's maybe it's changing as the rest of the region gets urbanized. But we always had this kind of split between people that I think understood and people that didn't really understand or didn't mm -hmm. trust or didn't like. And it seems to me like so with so many of these ballot measures that get put on the whatever it's called, um, there's some things that just were not thought through. Oh, yeah. You know, what are the possible ramifications if this passes, right. then this happens. And you have to wonder sometimes, what, what were they thinking when they thought this went up? Well, and, and sometimes they didn't even think. There was one, uh, one measure. Uh, part of the whole emphasis of the home, home rule charter was to move to more professional management, mm -hmm. where you would have fewer elected officials. Uh, uh, you would no longer elect the sheriff. You would appoint a sheriff. Uh, you would, uh, uh, I think, a s assessor was another one. You wouldn't elect your assessor. We would appoint somebody that really knew how to do this right. Uh, and then, and some of these charter changes came along, and they went back to the old formula and said, "Well, we want to elect all these people. We want to elect the elections director. We want to elect the sheriff." The one that was just totally bizarre uh, was that uh, they wanted to elect and passed it to elect a county clerk. Well, by the time we even had that amendment. Uh, the state had taken over the court, so there was a, we could ha we could elect a county clerk, but he had no duties because the county didn't run the courts anymore. The state did, and so I asked one of these guys <laughs> didn't that think put that this on the ballot. I said, you know, what, what what's up with that? How could you figure mm -hmm. that? And I said, oh, we didn't really care. That's what it was in the old days. That's good enough for us. That's the way it should be. Well, things have changed, pal. But you mm. get that you get that mindset. Mm -hmm. So in, in in state government. Who was your favorite person to write about? The one that was the most interesting to you? In state government yeah. or, or city or county? Well, well no, state government. 
Well, state government, of course, neither of the, my books has been about state government, so I haven't really focused on that. But in county government, Don Clark was really one of the heroes mm -hmm. of, uh, you talked about the, the yeah. mayors, but in the county government, he really was very focused on improving government and uh, had a very loyal uh, group of people that worked for him. And he was, he was not that great at, uh, presenting himself to the electorate. Mm -hmm. he, he really didn't uh, uh, put his best foot forward, if you will, and uh, ended up running for governor and ended up third, I think, out of three yeah, in the didn't primary and didn't, was not able to transfer. Very few people have been able to transfer government in local government to higher office. Is that absolutely right. Er yeah. Earl Blumenauer is one exception. Yes, I mean, as our yeah. U.S. representative was a county yeah. commissioner and then yeah. a city council member. Mm -hmm. And th then the guy I mentioned early on, Rufus Holman, uh -huh. uh, also uh, served in the United States Senate for one term mm -hmm. uh, from uh, well, I think 38 to 44, and he got beaten by Wayne Morse uh, with the young, the young Tiger Wayne. Mm -hmm. uh, when Wayne was uh, started out as a, you probably know this history. First, he was a Republican, and then he was an Independent, and then he was yeah. a Democrat. Mm -hmm. right. But he won his first right. term uh, as, as a Republican. Yeah, uh, uh, Don Clark is an interesting uh, f uh, figure, and and Don will agree. We've had a chance to visit with him. He just was not comfortable going to the business community. Mm -hmm. uh, he was he was a, had been a former county sheriff. Uh, he was very active in social service and social services mm -hmm. delivery, but uh, he just he was not comfortable going to the business community and asking support, which is kind of ironic for as good as he was in uh, being an efficient manager and, and, and a good steward of, of, of county management. Uh, and I think that was his failing politically, is that he, if he could have plugged into that business community even just a little bit, uh, he would have had a lot more support. What, you suppose he just didn't trust them? Is, was that the problem? I think he just wasn't comfortable with them. Don wasn't, I mean, wasn't a money guy in terms, in terms of making money. Mm -hmm. That wasn't important to him. He wanted to deliver, to deliver service and social service. And yeah. so I think he just wasn't comfortable sitting around yeah. trying to chat up executives that were always concerned about the bottom line. Yeah. But another uh, county chair who has recently made it good is uh, Ted Wheeler. Mm -hmm. was, he didn't last at the county very long because he was promoted, so to speak, and being appointed the interim uh, treasurer. Uh, but he, he came in and uh, brought order into chaos and really <laughs> was, uh, was very warmly received. And, and uh, uh, as far as outstanding county chairs, for the short time he was there, he's on yeah. that list. That was very interesting because he was really totally unknown when he ran for uh, for ran ran for county chair, and it was only because Di Diane Lynn had become such a controversial yeah. figure. Yeah, that uh, be that became kind of a mess. It, it certainly did, and, yeah. and Ted stepped in, and he had the had the ability to do it. And uh, I mean, I don't think the electorate knew him from Adam. I was going to a lot of neighborhood meetings in my reporting work at that time, and he was coming around to these neighborhood meetings that would have her 10 or 15 people and say, hi, I'm Ted Wheeler, I'm running for county chair, mm -hmm. need your support. And everybody was kind of flabbergasted. Wow, this guy came to see us. So. <laughs> yes, you had my vote. Yeah. All you had to do was show up. Yep. Listen, they're giving me the high signs so we have to ride on out of here. But uh, we've been talking with Jewel Lansing and Fred Leeson about their book, Multnomah, which is the history of Multnomah County. It's, it's fascinating work. And it's by OSU Press, which is always good. So. Um, I'm Jody C. This is Backpage. Be sure to join us again next time as we take another peek at the Backpage. And remember, we're all in this together. More of the same than different. Do your best. Thanks for Very nice.